and you should be damn ashamed of yourself, and I'm not gonna fight until people like you do not have a place to come on here on my campus that I paid a school to go to and spew your fucking lies. Well, I believe in the First Amendment. Do you believe in the First Amendment? Yeah, you, you, opinion. you actively, you actively deny science, ma'am. No, do you I'm have sitting a question? Here. I, you're spreading lies on my campus, and I'm not f***ing okay with that in the slightest. In Texas, since your heartbeat law went into effect, and you know, hundreds of lives are being saved, over 100 lives are being saved a day. You did that. You did that. Because it's her exactly. body, her choice. Exactly. Her body, exactly. Her act. body, her choice. Yeah, that is your argument. Right. Yes. And I'm saying not only women can get pregnant. Men can get pregnant too. There are such things as trans men. Trans men can get pregnant. I have no more questions, but I don't value your reasons. I will pray for you, though. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming out tonight. Really yeah. If you hate abortion, get a vasectomy. If you hate abortion, get a vasectomy. It's going to be a lovely, lively audience, which I love. I also have four children, so I'm used to crazy. So this is going to be good. Um, OK, so before I get started, before I get started, I always like to give some resources at the beginning of any presentation um, because we know when we speak about abortion, um, this is not uh, just an academic lecture. There are people here in this audience who've had a firsthand experience with abortion um, or who very well may likely have a firsthand experience with abortion in the near future. So if you know someone who is struggling following an abortion, um, I will want to point you to a website, supportafterabortion.com. This is a secular website where you can go and be connected with licensed counselors and psychologists uh, in your area, no matter where you're at in the country, uh, to, to help with post-abortion syndrome or feelings you may have following an abortion. Uh, the other website I want to give you is um, standingwithyou.org. This is a website that actually Students for Life of America runs. Uh, this is a place where uh, anyone can go, enter in their zip code, and be instantly connected with nonviolent resources in the community, public and private, as well as um, federally funded resources, community centers, pregnancy centers. You can begin an instant chat with a real person. Uh, or make a phone call. Um, and then also, uh, I want to direct you to abortionpillreversal.com. Um, you can reverse uh, an abortion pill procedure if you, if you stop the process after you take the first pill. So you, if you know someone who's taken an abortion pill and regrets that, uh, you can direct them to abortionpillreversal.com. There's doctors right here in San Antonio who will help reverse that process of the starvation of your child. Um, the fourth resource I will point you to is findahealthcenter.hrsa.gov. This is a government website funded by the Department of Health and Human Services, my old uh, employer, um, where you can get connected to a FQHC, a federally qualified health center. There's more than 8,000 federally qualified health centers that taxpayers already fund uh, that are true nonprofits in our community that provide every resource plus way more resources than Planned Parenthood would ever provide. They are located specifically in ur urban and rural neighborhoods. If you need a health care service uh, that they do not provide, um, they are actually legally mandated to help you find a doctor who can provide that service. And actually, if you can't get transportation, they actually, actually have to help you get transportation to that health care provider. So it's findahealthcenter.hrsa.gov. All right. So there's the disclaimers and all of the helpful resources. Um, for the past several months, uh, my family and I have been traveling throughout the American South. Um, and it's, it's been a really ed educational experience. There's history to be found in all over our country. And every little town um, we kind of stumble upon, especially as we were uh, in the panhandle of Florida and states like Louisiana and Mississippi, um, we stopped at a lot of places and we had a lot of discussions with our children about the Civil War and about slavery. 
Um, as I conduct uh, a lot of media interviews about the Mississippi law of banning abortions when children can feel pain at 15 weeks that we're currently waiting on the Supreme Court to rule on, the Dobbs v. Jackson case, um, likely that decision will come down in June. There's, been, there's a lot of uh, fanfare about that case because we believe it could lead us to a post-Roe America with the Supreme Court uh, striking down their egregiously wrong decision in 1973 when seven men decided to deny biology. But I can't help to think back to what happened after the Civil War. We talk a lot about the Civil War in our history classes. I uh, minored in history. My husband was a history major. Um, we, we talk a lot about the lead up to the Civil War in our history classes. We talk a lot about slavery. Um, but we don't really ever talk about Reconstruction. It's kind of quick. It's glanced upon uh, right before we go into the Industrial Revolution. We don't talk about the failure of Reconstruction. Um, the 99 years that it took from the end of the Civil War until the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964. The 99 years that it took uh, before black Americans received um, and was acknowledged in law full personhood, I would argue. When we were in Mississippi a couple weeks ago, um, we took our children to the Civil Rights Museum. And I, it was so important, I think, for, for my children to, to experience that, to have that conversation about what our nation once looked like, with Supreme Court sanctioned segregation, the fear of the night rides from the Klan, the fear of those in authority positions who looked the other way. It's important for us to talk about how we got to the point of the Civil Rights Act, why we needed the Civil Rights Act. Um, it took 100 years to get to that point, to what Martin Luther King called a positive peace. Not simply a negative piece, which Martin Luther King wrote about in his letter from Birmingham jail, a negative piece, which was the absence of tension, but a positive piece, which was the presence of justice. It took the murder of a little boy named Emmett and his murderer's acquittal. So that led to one woman who refused to give up her seat in Montgomery which led to marches in the streets, bus rides, to student-led sit-ins that began in Greensboro, which resulted in other student sit-ins, which resulted in days and weeks of jail time, which ex resulted in activists accepting the stinging pain of water hoses, of death threats, of bombings, of assassinations. When I, when I look back at this time in history, and even when my children had now learning about this time in history, Two very important questions always come to, to mind. I think the first one is, well, I think every person in this room, pro-abortion or anti-abortion, would agree. Um, yeah, pro what choice? Pro-abortion. The, choice, the choice to do what? Mm -hmm. We can get to that Q&A later. I'm totally fine admitting I'm anti-abortion. But why can't you accept the label pro-abortion? Why does that bother you so much? Yeah, because there's something wrong with the word abortion. But when we, when we look about this, this hundred years, I think everyone can agree that there's something wrong with waiting a hundred years from the end of slavery until the Civil Rights Act to end legal discrimination of black Americans. Everyone can agree on that, no matter your label. Um, but the question I have is, when we see an anti-abortion future, when Roe versus Wade and, and Doe versus Bolton, the two Supreme Court decisions which legalize abortion in all nine months for any reason, when we see the reversal of those decisions come down, how long will it take for our society to welcome every child in life and law? Will it take 100 years to transform our nation? And I think the second question that comes to mind when we think about this time in history, as we learn from what happened in our history, I think it's a question of when it took a few to act in courage, it took a few to stand and resolve, to stand up against an oppressor, against the oppressed, 
Will we be counted among them when the historians look back at this time in history, standing on the right side of human history? I think this is an extremely important question for all of us to ask ourselves, is what side will we be standing on? Are we standing on the predatory abortion side? Those in corporate abortion who literally make a profit off of the despair of women and men across the country using woke terminology and empty promises? Or will we say that we stood with the vulnerable, those who were given no voice, whose voice was simply taken away simply because of their size, simply because of their age, or simply because they may be a mere inconvenience? What side will we say we stood on? No matter, no matter where you stand on that question, I think we should all be able to agree that as we reconstruct our nation in a post-Roe world, as we reconstruct what it means to support women and men across the country, that we must stand together to make sure that no woman stands alone in a post-Roe v. Wade America. And that's exactly what the pro-life generation has been doing. The more than 1,300 groups that I'm honored to serve, the more than 130,000 young people that we've been able to train. And this is the mission that I'm here tonight to implore you to join me on, to join the fight against the violence of abortion. So tonight I'm going to make a very simple case why abortion is wrong. One, because abortion is an act of violence. <clears throat> the stronger oppressing the weaker. Yeah. Abortion harms women. And what will happen after Roe versus Wade is not what you've been hearing from the mainstream media. It is not back alley abortions. But what we will be in, be required to do, all of us, in a post rural world is ensure that she doesn't stand alone and that we stand beside her. And I hope to make the case to you that the pro-life movement is already doing that. We have to do more, but we're certainly doing that. So let's begin. One, the act of abortion intentionally ends the life of a living, whole, distinct, unrepeatable human being. That is science. <clears throat> the law of biogenesis states the law of biogenesis states that like begets like. No matter how many times I have sex with my husband, I cannot reproduce a koala bear. I want a koala bear. I turned down a speaking engagement to Australia not long ago, and I still regret that choice because I want to pet a koala bear. But I can't make a koala bear. Why can I make a koala bear? Because I'm a human, and my husband is a human. And the only thing that I can pro create is what? A human. So we know when we talk about the act of abortion, when we know when we talk about the act of abortion, we're not talking about the thing. We are talking about a human, a member of our species, because it simply can't be anything else. Biology, we also know that that human is alive. Biology textbooks define life like this. Life is specifically distinguished by the capacity to grow, metabolize, respond to stimuli, adapt, and reproduce. That is a preborn human being. A preborn human being is growing at a rapid pace. It can respond to stimuli. It can adapt to life and change as needed. And if you allow that baby to live, that baby will grow and create a new generation. Sometimes I think that those who are scouring the surface of Mars for life understand this definition better than some people here on Earth. Let's not name names, but they're in this room. <laughs> Let's just review a few of the key developmental markers. At week three, a heart has begun to beat. At week six, brainwave activity can be detected and hands of the child move. At week seven, it's, it's very funny that you wanted to what your argument is, is not denying science. That's not where you're going to win. At weeks, you, your argument is later. At week seven, the head rotates and legs move. The baby can hiccup. The heart, which began beating weeks ago, is nearly complete and beating quickly now. At week eight, my children love this fact. 
you're in production and release begins. They love that, because when my daughter was born, when they cut her out of my stomach, she began to pee, and it's on camera, Gracie peeing in mommy's tummy. Uh, they, that's amazing. Urine production begins while the child is in utero. At week nine, the baby can suck their thumb and move their tongue. At week 10, fingernails and toenails start to grow, and unique fingerprints are present. This is biology. This is embryology. This is undisputable fact. You can go to Google and type the development of a human being in, and you will see these images clearly. Now, through abortion, this unique whole living human being is ended violently. Something that was growing safely inside of his or her mother's womb is no longer. In fact, if an abortionist goes into a room and there are two hearts beating in an abortion, mothers and child, the abortionist only knows success in his or her job if one heart is beating when he or she leaves that room. That is exactly what happens during an abortion. To extinguish the early life, the fetus, a term for the early stage of life, just like toddler and adolescent, most commonly, um, I love them. <laughs> what, yeah. It's not like I do this for a living. It's literally like having 20 children. <laughs> to extinguish early life with the fetus, the DNC procedure is usually used or a chemical abortion pill is given. A DNC procedure stands for dilation curatage or suction curatage when the abortionist used a vacuum-like instrument to violently suck the child from the ch mother's womb and then uses a sharp edge curate to scrape the lining of the uterus to show, to ensure that no fetal parts or placental tissue remains. Fun fact, when a child is, is growing, the child develops its own organ to sustain itself, the placenta. It's amazing because the child is self-directed. This suction cannula that is used in abortion is 12 times more powerful than a household vacuum suction. A chemical abortion, called, most commonly called RU486, we call it a toilet bowl abortion, is when a woman is given two drugs, the first drug, mifepristone, which stops a natural substance, progesterone, from being released, which is needed for the baby to survive and grow. And then a second pill she takes, mifepristol, which then induces labor and causes an early abortion. This uh, is a very painful abortion. A woman goes through intense bleeding, cramping, often alone. She's told to sit in the toilet, do not look, and keep flushing. You do not have to be pro-life to be against chemical abortion. In fact, you can go to pregnancy chat rooms all over the internet where women who say they don't regret choosing abortion, but regret choosing a chemical abortion for the danger it caused and the pain it caused. The chemical abortions fail about 15% of the time. 5% of the time, there's a life-threatening consequence to those abortions. About 12% of abortions occur after the first trimester. 96% of those abortions are committed using a D&E procedure, dilation and extraction. The National Abortion Federation instructions for a D&E abortion are as follows. I pulled it right from their website. And here I brought even some of the instruments so you can see them. This is a child um, that's about 20 weeks old. So uh, once, you know, if you would wait, I'm going to do a total Q&A for you. And you can ask me any question you would want. Um, once the forceps has passed through the internal OS, open the jaws as widely as possible to encircle the fetal tissue and avoid pushing fetal parts deeper into the fundus. At 16 weeks, gestation, fetal skeletal development is such that the surgeon can manually sense the presence of fetal parts within closed jaws. After gas grasping a fetal part, withdraw the forceps while gently rotating it. So you have to clasp, they hold on, and you twist. 
After grasping it, withdraw the forceps while gently rotating. This maneuver brings the fetus into the lower uterine segment before the grass fetal part is separated and removed from the cervix. If a fetal extremity is brought through the cervix without separation, advance the forceps beyond the extremity to grasp part of the fetal trunk. Bringing the field trunk in the lower, mar lower segment markedly reduces the number of instrument passes into the fundus. During this procedure, try to identify and keep track of fetal parts as they are removed. A pouch or surgical pan at the edge of the table to catch fetal parts can assist in the process. It's because a child is, is breached in this time period, uh, it's usually leg, leg, arm, arm, trunk, and then finally the head. <clears throat> So, but that's not all late-term abortions. There's actually other late-term abortions. According to the Center for Disease Control, the abortion industry, an abortion industry think tank known as the Guttmacher Institute, named after the second president of Planned Parenthood, Alan Guttmacher, who is also the president of the American Eugenics Society, uh, a 1.3% of all abortions are late-term. They take place after 21 weeks, when a child can survive outside of the womb. It's so roughly about 11,400 children every year are killed in late-term abortions. <clears throat> so now, what we have to talk about is how do these late-term abortions, how are they committed? Well, like this. Partial birth abortion has been made illegal in our country. Uh, our new Supreme Court Justice, Ketanji Brown Jackson, uh, against her willingness uh, is illegal. She supports partial birth abortion. Partial birth abortion is when a child is delivered breached. The idea is as long as the child's head doesn't come out of the woman's vagina, it's not born. So you deliver the child breached until the, the, the head is the only part remaining in the woman's cervix. The neck is snipped. Uh, a suction device, a suction catheter from the first trimester abortion is inserted to the child's skull. The brain matter is sucked out. When you see white, that is brain matter. This will collapse the skull and then you deliver a dead child. But this was ruled to be too gruesome by the Supreme Court, not for Kentaji Brown Jackson, but for the rest of the Supreme Court. So in 2007, this type of abortion procedure was made illegal. The Supreme Court even said that this was unnecessary. So how do they kill children late in pregnancy now? Through this. It's a heart attack abortion. Digoxin is inserted through a woman's abdomen using ultrasound guided technology. The goal is to cause cardiac arrest. So digoxin or potassium chloride go into the mother's abdomen, pierce the child as close to the heart as possible. The goal is that the child goes into cardiac arrest, seaweed is inserted to the mother's vagina to ripen her cervix, and two to three days later, the goal is that she delivers a dead child with no beating heart. That's exactly how abortions are committed later term in pregnancy. So now I've made the case to you why a preborn child uh, hopefully should be spared from this violence. I've demonstrated to you that science proves that what's inside of a mother is a unique, whole, living human being. And I've also proven to you what happens to that human being during an abortion is nothing but an act of violence. So what about her? We also know in, in the pro-life movement we talk openly and frequently about the violence committed upon women and how the abortion lobby preys upon a crisis situation for profit. This is an industry that literally makes money off of her despair. Planned Parenthood has abortion quotas. If their facilities do not commit a certain number of abortions every month, their staff members actually get in trouble. That to me doesn't sound like somebody who's just simply trying to help women. But let's talk about how the abortion industry treats women. Kermit Gosnell, a lot of us have heard the story of Kermit Gosnell, the abortionist operating a legal abortion facility in Philadelphia, who pediatricians across Philadelphia at his murder trial came and actually admitted on the witness stand that they actually had to stop referring their pediatric patients to him because they were coming back from their abortions with venereal diseases from dirty instruments. Kermit Gosnell was not an outlier. Yes, he did have different waiting rooms for black and white patients. There was cat piss and urine and feces all over the clinic. He did have children in milk jugs in the employee refrigerator, yes. 
But we often hear that this is an outlier situation, that Kermit Gosnell isn't representative of the abortion industry. But the fact was, it was Planned Parenthood in the abortion industry who had lobbied in Harrisburg, the state capital of Pennsylvania, against laws that actually would have saved his last victim, Katamaya Monger, an immigrant who died on the operating table because a teenager had administered anesthetic to her who had no training in anesthesia. And when the EMTs were finally called to resuscitate Katamaya Monger, they couldn't get to her because she was on the second floor. And the elevator wasn't big enough for the gurney. The hallways weren't big enough for her gurney. But the abortion industry said that was choice. That was access, and that trumped her safety. But he's not an outlier. Um, a pro-life group, Americans United for Life, a couple of years ago did a study using FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Act, and they, they wrote to state officials asking what had happened if states had actually inspected their abortion facilities. They used an eight-year window from 2008 to 2016. They were only able to get 30 states, and this excluded California and New York, the two largest abortion states. They refused to cooperate. But they were found 30 states who would be willing to give them the open inspection records of abortion facilities in their state. In eight years, they found 1,400 health and safety violations from over a third of abortion facilities in our country, 227. In April 2016, an abortion facility in Virginia was shut down after they found, they wrote a 52-page deficiency report that included evidence that a staff member assisted in abortion after unclogging a toilet, but before changing scrubs or properly cleaning her hands. Then the abortionist had saved a blood-smeared surgical gown for further use, rather than putting in a laundry. That surgical equipment was smeared with foreign material and dried in yellow-brown splatter. In 2015, they found an investigation that an Atlanta TV station had done, reviewing the inspection records for all of Georgia's licensed abortion facilities that uncovered multiple and repeated health and safety violations, like using expired medicine from 10 years ago, a vent in a biohazard room taped with cardboard, stirrups wrapped in duct tape, soil, linens, and procedure rooms. The top 10 violations, the, the top one, was failure to ensure a safe and sanitary environment. More than 130 abortion facilities and 22 states failed to follow established infection control protocols. Failure to accurately document medical records and keep patient medical information confidential. At least 100 abortion facilities in 17 states failed to appropriately annotate and handle patient medical records. The third highest was failure to ensure staff are properly trained for duties. At least 82 abortion facilities in 14 states failed to proper train their staff before abortion facilities. And we can go further. We don't have to just look into dirty abortion facilities. Let's also look at what else happens. You can go to the NIH's website, pubmed.gov. This is a collection of all of the peer-reviewed medical studies in our country. You can type in the word abortion and you will be flooded with studies from here in the United States and across the globe about how abortion harms women. The Canadian Journal of Psychiatry reported after adjusting for sociodemographics, abortion was associated with increased likelihood of severe mental disorders and mood disorders, anxiety disorders, as well as suicidal ideation and suicidal attempts. Our study confirms a strong association between abortion and mental disorders. A 2019 maternal study in Italy in the Archives for Women's Mental Health said the suicide rate of women who had abortions was more than double the suicide rate of women who gave birth. I can just keep going. There's a Finnish study indicates that the year following an abortion, women were three times more likely to commit suicide than the general population, and nearly six times more likely to commit suicide than women who gave birth. The Journal of Psychiatry Research said there was a positive association between induced abortion and several psychiatric disorders in Germany. This goes on and on and on. And this is just PubMed. This isn't a pro-life source, a pro-life website. A British Journal of Psychiatry uh, article found using a meta-analysis of 15 years of published research found that there was an 81% likelihood of increased mental health problems, 110% likelihood to abuse alcohol, a 37% more likely to have depression, 34% more likely to develop anxiety orders, 155% more likely to commit suicide. It's unbelievable that the stats are right there. 
A 2003 landmark article in Obstetrical and Gynecological Survey compiled said that a, a risk of placenta previa and later pregnancy increased um, placenta previa, pre, uh, previa by 50% and doubled the risk of preterm birth. This is actually common information. The second question they ask you at OBGYN's office after you go in and say you're pregnant, first they ask you is how you're gonna pay. The second question they ask you is how many abortions have you had, how many miscarriages, and how many live births? Why? Because the risk to placenta previa, the risk to preterm birth, is commonly known in the medical community, even amongst pro-abortion OBGYNs. A 2014 cancer causes control study it was a Chinese study, it was a meta-analysis, said that it was the third study in three months showing a positive link between abortion and breast cancer with a meta-analysis of 36 states, 36 studies that covered 14 states or provinces in China. There was also a Bangladesh study in 2014 suggested that abortion raised the risk of breast cancer by 20%. These are facts. This is what we see time and time again, but it's not discussed in, in, in the abortion um, rights movement for sure. What we often hear is this scare tactic um, about abortion is why we need abortion to be legal is because we want abortion to be safe. They used to say safe, legal, and rare. That's actually not accepted protocol anymore in terminology in the abortion movement. It's safe. It's, no, it's legal and accessible. They didn't... It's not rare, and it's certainly not safe. The abortion movement actually has gone to the Supreme Court arguing against safe abortions and common sense regulations. But we, also, we often hear uh, from the abortion rights movement that we have to keep abortion legal. Even if you don't like abortion, we have to keep abortion legal because what about back alley abortions? Women will be so desperate to commit abortions that we have to have abortion legal. I have been shocked since I've been in Texas for the past month that the alleys that I was in in Dallas and the alleys I've been in in Houston walking from uh, restaurants to parking garages, there haven't been dead women bleeding out in alleys across the country. It's been actually amazing. I was in every airport in Corpus Christi and Houston and Dallas, and it's been shocking to me that there was women in business suits with high heels obviously going all about their work, that they weren't enslaved, barefoot, and pregnant in the kitchen. I've been bringing greetings from Texas all across the country because the rhetoric that you heard surrounding the Texas heartbeat law was that there was going to be women bleeding out, dying in back alleys across Texas, and that women's rights were going to be set back, and that women aren't going to be smart enough to decide that they can have it all, that they can complete their education, they can have a career and keep their child and not end the life of a human being. But we hear this a lot, this back alley abortion myth, and we're going to hear it more. So let me give you some facts from Planned Parenthood's own esteemed researchers. Dr. Bernard Nathanson, the co-founder of NARAL, which was National Association of Appeal of Abortion Laws. Dr. Nathanson, he and Larry Lather, the, bi the biographer of Margaret Sanger, founded NARAL. They are the ones that said they fully admitted to making up the myth that 10,000 women were dying every year from illegal abortions. Later in life, when he became Later in life, when he became pro-life, he actually admitted he made it up. But you don't have to trust Bernard Nathanson because he later became pro-life, so you can't trust pro-lifers. So let me give you some information from an esteemed pro-abortion researcher, Christopher Teets. Ever heard of him? He won Planned Parenthood's highest honor in 1974, the Margaret Sanger Award. Yes, this very same award that Nancy Pelosi has won. The award named after the founder of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, the woman who called human beings weeds and thought that some people should be forcibly sterilized because of their stock or what color of skin that they had. Christopher Teets in 1974, 1974 won Planned Parenthood's highest honor. What did he win the honor for? His research. The Washington Post brings out his work time and time again. The Washington Post found a 1948 paper where Christopher Teets wrote that the number of deaths from abortion was rapidly declining, rapidly declining because of penicillin and other drugs to fight infection. By 1959, a lead, uh, leading researcher and the, then the medical director of Planned Parenthood, Mary Calderon, wrote, quote, abortion is no longer a dangerous procedure. In 1957, this is Planned Parenthood's own medical director, 
1957, there were 260 deaths in the whole country attributed to abortions of any kind. She then went on to attribute the decline of abortion deaths in women because due to, was due to antibiotics. And she said in her estimation, this is once again 1959, that 90% of illegal abortions were being committed by trained physicians who she wrote were in good standing in their communities. In 1969, Christopher Teets wrote again, some 30 years ago, it was judged that such deaths might number five to 10,000 per year. But this rate, even if it was approximately correct at the time, cannot be anywhere near the true rate now. The total number of deaths, once again, this was 1969, the total number of deaths from all causes among women of reproductive age in the US is not more than 50,000 per year. The National Center for Health Statistics listed 235 deaths from abortion in 1965. Total mortality from illegal abortions was undoubtedly larger than that figure, but in all likelihood, it was under 1,000. That is from Christopher Teets, Planned Parenthood's own award-winning statistician who won their highest award, the Margaret Sanger Award, the Maggie Award. So I know there's been a lot of buts that have probably formed in your minds. If I got through to you at all, I might have made some sense using facts and logic. But then the question really we have is what is next? What is next? What choice do women have uh, when Roe is reversed, when uh, abortion is no longer legal, when we enter in this anti-abortion future. We tell a woman that she has to choose. I actually think this is a, one of the saddest facts about the abortion lobby today in America. We tell her to be all that she can be. We learned that as young girls in school, that we were equal to the men in our lives, if not better. I would argue that you know, we can do three things men can't ever do, lactate, gestate, and menstruate, so take that, men. And we can multitask a lot more at it. Um, so when we tell women that she can be anything she wants to be, that she can do whatever she wants to do, whatever education or career goals that she wants to seek, but then we tell her she can't. She can't also become a mother, that she's not able to also choose another person, to put another person above self. I would say that the options that are often presented to women across the country is not choice, it's coercion. The biggest emotion that women have been saying that they feel, this has actually been really interesting in Texas, since your heartbeat law went into effect, and you know, hundreds of lives are being saved, over 100 lives are being saved a day, you did that, you did that. Uh, since that law went into effect, I, I've been wondering and asking folks across the, across the state of Texas, what has been the result? Uh, what does this mean? What are women saying? How do they feel when they are faced with an unplanned crisis pregnancy and they find out that abortion is no longer a legal option for them? And it's fascinating to me, it's absolutely fascinating to me that the abortion the pregnancy abortion helplines are reporting that the number one emotion that women are reporting when they're told abortion isn't legal in Texas at their point of pregnancy is the notion of relief. That the women are commonly saying the pressure is off. I think that is a stunning, stunning indictment in our society today. That she feels that the right choice, that the responsible decision to make is the end of life of her child, but then that she feels relief when she knows that it's not actually an option anymore. I think that's a stunning indictment in our failure as a society to support women, to show women that you can choose both and that in fact you are strong enough to choose both. That you don't have to fall for the lies of those who profit off of your despair. That you can choose other over self and still accomplish your goals. But how do we get to this point? What else do we need to do to ensure that in an anti-abortion future, no woman stands alone? And this is really just, just as much for pro-abortion, anti-abortion people as it is for pro-abortion people. It starts first in high schools. It, first, it starts first in high schools, uh, educating our generation about responsible decision making. It's amazing with the invention of birth control and the legalization of abortion has severed sex from procreation. 
Many people are simply astounded when I say a very simple fact that a natural result of heterosexual sex is the reproduction of a new human life. It should not come to a surprise that if you are engaging in heterosexual sex, this is a natural consequence of your behavior. If we talk about wanting to stop the cycle of poverty in our country, that begins with stopping unintended pregnancies, and that begins by teaching our young people about responsible decision making. The Brookings Institute, a pro-abortion uh, think tank, not pro-life, has a, has a very simple uh, report on their website. It's called Three Rules Poor Teens Should Follow to Join the Middle Class. Their data strongly suggested that if you marry the person you're having sex with, um, that is the best thing you can do to ensure that your child doesn't live in poverty. They said that there are three things you can do that practically will eliminate you uh, and your children from living in poverty. The first thing is get a high school degree. Second is get a full-time job. And the third thing is wait till 21 to get married and have children. Only 2% of people who do those three things live in, below or at the federal poverty line. But I'm a realist. I understand that that doesn't affect everyone. Not, you know, mistakes happen. But I think then we need to talk about safe haven laws. That no woman in our country, no man in our country are forced to actually become a mother who's responsible for another human being for 18 years. That in every state across the country, you can surrender your child without any recourse three days after your child is born to government officials. With safe haven laws, why do you need to destroy that child? What's the intention if you can legally give up that child without any recourse? At Students for Life, our team works with high school and college students every day as we support pregnant and parenting students. And we do this in a variety of ways, whether it's getting diaper decks installed in women's and men's bathrooms, forcing schools to install lactation rooms, um, making sure schools uh, provide uh, parking accessibility to pregnant students and making sure desks are large enough for pregnant students to sit in, um, making sure that resources in the community are actually provided for and talked about in the school student handbook or in the uh, health center. We also rate schools. We rate colleges, private, public, uh, Christian, community college to, to to really inform the community about where uh, those colleges stand in supporting pregnant and parenting women. It's amazing just putting out public rankings, uh, how quickly we see results happen in these campuses. We also have to work to inform on Title IX rights to ensure that students who are pregnant giving birth uh, can get their exams rescheduled or they can make up participation points in class. Um, Title IX is a federal law that protects the rights of women and men to have same educational opportunities. But you would be astounded by how many schools the Title IX officer is not publicly present. The school doesn't educate their students on their federally protected Title IX rights. We've actually had to write schools, threaten lawsuits to ensure that students' Title IX rights um, are upheld. Students like Ruth in Colorado Springs, who was told she would lose her federal aid because she was giving birth during an exam, and that made her have an incomplete. The school literally gave her an incomplete for having giving, have the audacity to give birth to her son, Eli. She dropped out of school. It was Students for Life when we found out about this case who wrote the school a very strongly worded letter threatening a federal lawsuit, who saw Ruth's financial aid reinstated, who raised the money to ensure that she could pay off the student loans and to get her back in school. She graduates this year. It was Students for Life at Fordham University, a Catholic school, when the Catholic school told Eleanor to go have an abortion because you know, she couldn't be pregnant and be on campus. And then when she chose life, moved in with her boyfriend and her boyfriend's mother in the Bronx so she could stay in school, it was the school who took away her scholarship fund for housing, saying it was her choice to move off campus. It was Students for Life who came alongside her and helped her fundraise. It was Students for Life in Maryland, when a teenager got pregnant at a small Christian school, and her, sc her school told her that she was going to be expelled. And then they came back and said, well, you're not expelled, but you have to step down as student body president. You have to resign your post as um, captain of the volleyball team. But you can't walk in graduation. It was Students for Life who stepped up and went to the New York Times to publicly humiliate the school and get the uh, 
uh, principal fired after they refused to allow Maddie to walk in graduation. It was us who threw her an alternative graduation ceremony. It was our supporters who raised $25,000 to pay for her first year of college. That is what Students for Life does. That is what the pro-life movement does. Every single day, the pro-life movement operates nearly 3,000 pregnancy centers and nearly 400 maternity homes all across the country that provide resources and support to women who choose life. We're stepping up to lead and lead in a big way. We knocked 107,000 doors in 20 cities this year in neighborhoods surrounding abortion facilities, educating community members about nonviolent alternatives that exist. But sadly, nearly 80% of the people we talked to in those, those 107,000 doors did not know that the pregnancy center, that the maternity home, that nonviolent resources exist. So there's much, much more to be done. Whether it's in the workplace, talking about the Pregnancy Non-Discrimination Act, ensuring that workplaces are more accommodating to pregnant and parenting women. We, the, there was an article not long ago from Citibank where they said that any Texas employee can go get her abortion and they would pay for it. Oh, how freaking woke of them. They would pay for her abortion. Why? Why would they pay for her abortion? Why was it Citibank's interest to do it? Because it's cheaper for them. The most expensive thing as a business owner, the most expensive thing as someone who operates an actual business is replacing your employee, handling the training of new employees when somebody goes on temporary leave. It's in these CEOs and these big businesses interest, financial interest, to ensure that women CEOs, women executives, women employees have an abortion because then they don't have to worry about her going on maternity leave. They don't have to worry about her bringing her child to the birth workplace or storing her breast milk in the staff refrigerator. It's hard work accommodating women in the workplace. Instead of doing it, they'd rather her just have an abortion. So we have work to do in corporate America. We also have work to do on our college campuses. I go to college campuses all the time, and I'm constantly looking on college campuses. Where are the resources in the handbooks? I can often find in the handbooks the ordinances about amplification. I can find ordinances about uh, not having hoverboards on campus. But try to find in your student handbook where to go if you're pregnant, where to go if you don't want to drop out of school. The best way to ensure she and her child don't live in poverty is to ensure she graduates. A child born into poverty is seven times more likely to live in poverty his or her whole life. She needs to stay in school for her and her family's sake. We have to do more in our schools. We also have to do more in our high schools, like I said, talking about the resources that are available. So, I got us started on a couple of things that we need to do. I would love to take your questions about abortion. Uh, maybe you have an idea for what can be done here at UTSA or in the broader San Antonio area or throughout Texas to support women to ensure that as we step into an anti-abortion future, she doesn't stand alone. So I'll take your questions now. You have to go to the microphone, please. They should be respectful. Hello? Is it, is it on? I, is this on? I don't know. I can't hear you. If you want to be next, sir. Hi. There you go. Hi. Okay. Um, my name is Darby. Um, I just want to. I just want to read you this poster that I have um, because I hear a lot of pro-lifers um, say that life begins at conception, mm -hmm. and I want to read you this poster that I have. And I have a couple other things to say. They're not necessarily questions, but I would like to hear what you do have to say about them. So my poster reads. Life begins when you understand living women matter more than potential babies. What is it? What do you mean? If it's a potential baby, what is inside of a woman? It's a fetus. It's a fetus. Is it living? No. no. How can it grow if it's not living? That's like saying... 
that that's like saying. Hold on, guys. Yeah, because trees are living. That's, trees grow because trees are living. Hey, well, actually, actually, that's like saying if an acorn is a tree. That's like saying an acorn is an oak tree. It has to develop. It has to develop into that oak tree. So you, it's you, called an analogy. I don't so know when if you've does ever the heard of it. when does the Y'all fetus like to use analogies. when does the fetus become living? Um, that's actually a good question, but that line... Yeah, of course, because you don't know it, because it's oh, living. Oh. It's living. You, you're, you're fundamentally denying science to validate you, your opinion. You, you actively, you actively deny science, ma'am. How am I denying... What science did I deny, Darby? Um, okay, so let's look at some posters over here. Hey, Maddie, can you raise your poster? Yes, I can. Hey. But you don't have to be here. I need you to tell me what science, you just made an accusation that I denied science. What science did I deny? That it's a child inside of you. It is a clump of cells when you I'm have a clump of cells. What makes me different? That you were born? You were born. So you, you don't, what you're arguing is that uh, anything that is not born is not valuable of life. Of I right did not life. say that. It's subjective. So when does it? When does a child or fetus or clump of cells, whatever you want to call it, when does this clump of cells or fetus become living? When it can sustain but, its own life. But when is that? When is the sustainability? No. When is sustainability? Uh, Because like what, how do you sustain life? Like my newborns aren't sustainable. You can't just have a newborn and they just like live on their own, right? Right. They're not sustainable. They need help and assistance to survive. So is a newborn not, is, is a newborn not worthy of life? Is a newborn not worthy of life? Okay. Would you like to, would you like to come see? Actually, just actually, let I have, her, let her finish. I do have one thing to say sure. to you. How is it that when my mom was in college 30 years ago, mm -hmm. she was protesting the exact same thing that me and these wonderful other women and men on this side mm -hmm. have been protesting? How is it? Why? Why? Are we still protesting? Why are we still having to talk about this issue? It is a basic human right. To do what? To have an abortion, to have a choice. What's an abortion? What, what is an abortion? What, what is, define for me why abortion is. What is an abortion? Taking a fetus out of a woman's body. Is a fetus living? No. No. We've been over that. How can a fetus grow if it's not living? Explain to me the science of it. How is a fetus living if it, how is it growing if it's not living? My pubes grow, but they're not living. Things grow. The because your pubic is, no, hair is talking. a part of you. I'm not done talking. You assigned value to your children, and that is the difference between your living children, the ones that you gave birth to. That is the difference between somebody who is holding a, a fetus in their body, a woman who is pregnant. If she does not want that baby, she has not assigned the same value to it that you have to your own children. Do They're forced. I'm, Do I'm not done talking. I am not done talking. I said I'm not done talking. Okay, you can keep yelling at me, but I'm just asking. Do you I, think you can't cut me off, lady. You can't I'm cut me off. I'm asking you a clarifying question, ma'am. I think I think you're getting into a slippery slope, though, because I'm what not. you're saying is assigning value. All, all, all of your arguments are slippery slopes, my friend. Another thing that I would like to point out that is pseudoscience, it's just wrong, is that you said heartbeats begin before six weeks. That is wrong. Those are electrical impulses because they don't have a fully formed heart yet. Yes, their heart is electrical not impulses formed. are not the same as a heartbeat, honey. They're not. And you're wrong. I have a question. It's pseudoscience. And you, you can't keep spreading lies. Me? No, I'm sitting here. I, you're spreading lies on my campus, and I'm not fucking okay with that in the slightest. I'm more my concerned team. that you just said that some people can assign value to other human beings oh, yeah, or not. Yeah. So what you just heard was a slippery slope argument. And that's actually very concerning. Mm -hmm. Because when some people get to say that some people Excuse have me, rights 
and other people don't the have dean, rights, the dean of that, is, trying to get your she, she, she's trying to get that is a slippery slope because that's exactly what we've seen time and time again throughout human history and throughout our American history when we decided that some people have rights and some people don't, and it depends on you to give them value. You, you that never, never ends very well. You never answered my question about why we're still having to have this conversation. Do you want me to answer the question? That's I'd love to. I, I the reason we're still having the question is because some people don't want to accept the natural consequences of heterosexual sex and be inconvenienced by another human life and want to selfishly choose to end human life in order to have their whims met. That is why you're still arguing. So, so, so when I was, so when I was raped, ooh, yeah, got real quiet, didn't it? When I was raped, and I, if I, if if I was impregnated, I would have to bear that child, because because the government says so, because you want to take away my right to not bear that child. I don't want to have to bear the child of my rapist who, hey, by the way, walks free on this campus. Yeah. And he raped me in high school. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a real shocker. And please do not say, oh, I am sorry that you were raped. I am sorry that that happened to you. But why, why would I have to bear the child of my rapist? Do you want me to answer? Yeah, I, I would love to hear your opinion. Before Please. You, before you answer, mm -hmm. may I just take a moment? Do you want the microphone? I would love the microphone. Go ahead. All right. So, before we continue, everybody, take a moment and breathe. Okay? I felt the tension in the room go down just a notch by doing that. We are not here to yell at each other. We can't hear you if you're yelling. And the only way that this works well is if one person with a mic and the other person with a mic use the mics, and then if everyone else can listen, and if you have a question, you can come here and line up, and then you can contribute with your question or your comment. We have a lot of people here and so after you are finished with your comment or your question, we'd appreciate it if you sit back down so that other people can also comment. Okay? Can yes, we all agree on that? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. You I could have used that announcement during my talk when I had to shout over people shouting at me. Um, I was trying. So I'm going to answer your question. Yeah, um, and go I ahead. You can sit down, and then there'll be another question. Yeah, so absolutely. Can, uh, That's fine. I am sorry that you were a victim of sexual assault. <laughs> Did, didn't I no, just, say, he just say to not say that? I am sorry <laughs> that you were a victim of sexual assault and you've had to survive that. Uh, I, and I can't I, think of any, excuse me, I can't think of anything um, more heinous to happen to another human being than sexual assault. Answer the question. But I would say that every human being has value. And that doesn't matter the circumstance of your conception. If I were raped and I chose not to have an abortion, I became pregnant because of the rape. If I was one of the five percent who became pregnant, if I chose the not to have an abortion, excuse me, if I chose not to have an abortion, would I be justified at two years old to kill my child? Why? Why is that? Why is that an outrageous statement? Why? Be because we acknowledge it's a living child, and even those who, who support abortion acknowledge it's a living child. That, my friends, is the crux of our argument in the pro-life movement, that a child before birth is, is the same as a child after birth. You didn't come from a fetus. That's not reality. You did not come from a clump of cells. You, in fact, once were a fetus. You want to wear whatever the name you want to subscribe to a child basic in the information room. and then trying to and take your own value, spin on it is excuse not me, work. you just excuse me. You're your you value in me. the womb is the same as your value Sorry. outside of the womb. Mike. And in the pro-life movement, we believe that every human being has an equal right to life and is equally valuable. That the crimes of our parents, uh, the crimes of our fathers, 
do not mean that we do not have value or that that justifies the ending of our human life. I think as a pro-life movement and as human beings in general, when it comes to sexual assault, we should be willing to go as, as far as we can to support victims and survivors of sexual assault. But my support ends when you ask me to end the life of a human being. Just like how I, if you asked me to end the life of your rapist, I couldn't do that either. I didn't can I say ask that. you a new so, question? Okay, next question. You guys can go behind the end of the line. Okay, okay, so a lot of you pro-life people like to equate owning a slave to wanting an abortion, and I want you to explain to me how that's not racist in of itself. Yeah, so when I started off my talk talking about reconstruction and the end of slavery, and I think it's really important to do that because we have to remember the Supreme Court has been wrong lots of times throughout human history. The Supreme Court ruled that people who are, you know, married couples, white and black, shouldn't be allowed to marry. They've actually ruled that certain people, depending on their IQ, should be forcibly sterilized. The Supreme Court ruled that black Americans weren't full persons. So when you hear the pro-life movement talk about slavery, talk about historical injustices. You're not just Excuse talk, me. I'm when you hear us talk about historical injustices that are committed, the reason we talk about uh, slavery, the reason we, we will sometimes bring up what Nazi Germany, the atrocities Nazi Germany committed against Jewish brothers and sisters, is because these are all times in history, excuse me, these are all times in history where the popular opinion was that because society or because the majority said that a certain person wasn't the, wasn't the right skin color, didn't have the right religion, that it was, it was okay to discriminate against that person. It was okay to enslave that person. It was okay to blow those people into cattle cars and send them to concentration camps, never to walk outside freely again. That is why, when we, in the pro-life movement, when we talk about and when you hear it brought up, because this is exactly what we do to the pre-born child in the womb. We say, because they're inconvenient or because we don't like them or whatever, they're not full humans. They're not full persons. And guess what? We've done that time and time again throughout human history, and the result is always devastation and destruction. I'd like to add one more thing. It's uh, really fucking laughable that it's only white people equating slavery to owning an abortion. Not once have I heard one black or woman of color. Faith, do you want to come up here? Because apparently color do, matters. I, I, would, I would like to hear from a person, a woman of color, why sure, that isn't racist. Sure, Faith, come on up here. I would because rather hear that. That's, that's really, okay, that's really. Go ahead, Faith. What's so funny? Why are you pro-life, Faith? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm literally. Go ahead, Faith. Tell us why you're pro life. What? I am pro life because life begins in the womb at conception. And I think that our personhood, our rights, should not be based on having to be human plus something else. That's exactly what happened with slavery, where we were told that you have to be human plus not black. And now we're saying that you have to be human plus a certain age or human and in a different location. And so really what abortion is, is age-based discrimination. Black people weren't seen as humans. They weren't seen as human beings. Like, Black people for, were not seen as humans. They were like... Uh, the Supreme Court actually said that they were three-fifths a they human were, person. Just like how you all have denied that a child in the womb is a human person. No, it's not. It's not a human. Not a human. That's fundamentally incorrect. It's fun. What is it? What is a child in the womb? Is it a koala bear? When I get pregnant, am I pregnant with a koala bear? I'm, a, I'm pregnant with a member of our species. You're like a dolphin. It looks the same as a fetus. It's a human. You literally can't tell them apart because it's not human yet. It's not. Does somebody else have a question? I just want to know. I just want to note that as a black woman and as a person who got my degree in biology, life does begin at conception. <laughs> It gets very interesting when people define their own definition of life because that's. Scary. I have a personal question for you. Mm -hmm. Are your beliefs about um, abortion and life and conception that is that have anything to do with your personal religious beliefs? And I also want to add on your beliefs about 
having sex because you mention a baby as an acceptable consequence for someone who had sex. But how could a child who is, like in Texas, sex education isn't even like, you don't even have to have that here. In this entire state, do you know how many people grow up and not even knowing what, a, what their first period is? Not knowing that, oh, they think that you can have sex on your period and you won't get pregnant. Like there's people out here, like underprivileged children who have sex early on because frankly, when you're having sex at 11 to 13 years old, that's not normal. Something's going wrong. Something's not okay. And the fact that you're saying that you're having sex, you got pregnant, that's your own damn fault. So your consequence should be, oh, but you're not, you can't drive yet. You can't vote yet. Hell, you can't even make food for yourself yet. But you have to have this child. I'm gonna make you bear the child. And I'm not gonna give you the right to choose a safe abortion. And that I could, this is for anyone. Because not everyone has the same moral background and was raised the same way as you. Some people are raised a completely different way and believe completely different things about sex mm -hmm. and babies and your belief that life being is a conception that is not shared by a lot of people. It's not shared by me. It's not shared by any of my friends. So I'm asking you, why should your moral belief be the end all be all and make the law and take away the right to a, scene, a clean, safe abortion for women to have? Because you talk about like, oh, 5% of um, people, women that are raped being pregnant. 5% is still 2.9 million women who have become pregnant from rape in their lifetime. You know, like, just because it's the minority, minority statistics are real people. Yeah. Shit happens. People become pregnant. People are raped. And the fact that you can sit here and say that the rapist baby, the seed or whatever you want to call it, the baby that's still in your belly and that it's not born yet, that you should be forced to have that, it's disgusting. And the fact that you can come over here and have an entire career based off of this, and I'm not done speaking. And then you can sit here in front of question. my friend who was a victim of rape and say that she should have that baby. It's disgusting. And you should be damn ashamed of yourself. And I don't believe that. And I'm not going to fight until people like you do not have a place to come on here on my campus that I paid a school to go to and spew your fucking lies. Well, I believe in the First Amendment. Do you believe in the First Amendment? Do you? Do you believe in the First Amendment? I've allowed you to sit here and scream at me for an hour and a half. And, I'm and saying I don't believe that you should have the right to take away my access to a clean, safe abortion as a human right. I have the right to have the autonomy over my own body. You have the right to your autonomy over your own body. We both get knocked up, have sex, both of us pregnant. You want to abort it? You don't want to abort it? Your decision. Mm -hmm. If I want to abort it, I'm going to fucking do that. Okay. So who are you to sit yeah, here and so tell me that? Yeah, so I don't want to own a slave, but you want to own a slave. Am I supposed to just sit around and say that? Do that's not right? sit here in front of a microphone and compare owning a slave to me, you white that's fucking bitch. You have no idea to sit here and say this shit to me. Ma'am, that is the argument you just made. No, it's not. No, it is not. That is your incorrect interpretation. That is a logical fallacy. That you is you the think argument? you can sit here and go ring around the rosy the with argument? me? Are you done with your question? Because you asked me like... You questions. haven't answered anything. You've actually you just made a statement and completely anything. deterred my argument in a completely different way. Oh, do you question. think that you can own a slave? If I want to own a slave, can I own a slave? How can you sit here with a straight face and say that to me? Aren't how you, how you, is you yes. not embarrassed okay, of yourself? Okay, you want me to answer the question? How can you sit here and deny biology? This how can you sit here and deny biology? I'm going to ask you the same question. Do you want me to answer your questions? If you will sit down, I will answer your question. I want, no, I'm going to stand right here, and okay, I want well, you to you tell me how you me think it's so okay to compare question. owning a slave to having an abortion. Yes. And yes. it's not even in the same ballpark. Yes. Because white people were not seen as people in this country. Yes, they just were like what you've done time and time again tonight to an unborn child. You have argued. Unborn you child, are, not living. You are, black people already existed. They were born. Unborn they were children are like living, literally man. born into slavery. Would you like me to answer your questions? I can't answer if you keep screaming at me. Do you want me to answer your questions? I'm waiting. Are you going to stop? Are talking? you going to answer my question? Yes. Or are you going to sit here and look stupid? I'm quiet right now. I'm quiet. This is why we have the First Amendment, so they can Am do I this. speaking? So, no. When we talk about abortion, we talk about the living human being that's present inside of a mother's womb. Biology t confirms this fact. This is not a religious belief that I hold. This is a scientific fact. The law of biogenesis says like begets like. 
We know the definition of life, and we know what's inside of a mother is living because that, ch that child is growing. You can call the child a fetus, a clump of cells, whatever, but the fact is that entity, which is a member of our human species, because I, two humans, can't reproduce anything other besides a human, is in fact alive. The arguments that you're making to support your extremist beliefs to justify It's not extremist. It's that basic the human right that you're trying to take doesn't away from have me. Value. The argument you're trying to and failing to make in the argument that you really You don't get to sit here and tell me what my on. argument is. If you want to answer my question, then answer my question. you said you'd be quiet. Answer the, the question. The argument you're failing to make and what you argument you should be making is that you believe that the human inside of the womb has less value than a woman. And that certain people get yes, to Yes, it does, because it's her exactly. body, her choice. Exactly. Her body, exactly, her act, body, her choice. Yeah, that is your argument. Sorry, it is not that it's not a human being or that's not living, because that's flat out denying biology. We know it's living and we know it's a human being. What else? What you're be? arguing is that, that that child doesn't have the same right to life as his or her mother. Because you have decided, and what you said during your comments mm -hmm. was that if I got pregnant and chose not to have an abortion, I can do that. But you can choose to have abortion because mm -hmm. the mother gets to decide the value of that person. The mother that is it's exactly, the mother's child. That's damn, exactly what you're I'm not saying. Let me answer your question. That's exactly what Shut happened. Up. That's exactly what happened in pre-Civil War America. You can choose to assign value to black Americans depending on what you felt like. You could say, oh, wow. I am against slavery because I know wow. these people are human beings that have value and no one has the right to own another human person. But if I was a plantation owner in the South, There's I could no say, yeah, they have life. some value, but they don't people have like full value because I like deem it. It's a Twitter. slippery slope. And that is not, by the way, that is not a religious belief. This is a scientific belief that this is a human being. Where we can differ on our belief is the value ask we assign. No, there's other people behind you. The I have value actually one more question to ask, and she said I could ask a that question. That is the actual debatable question here today. No, is what it's is not. the value we assign to human beings in the womb? Does a human being in the womb have the same oh value, God, are you gonna stop the same going right to life as other people, yourself? or do they not? That is the true pro-abortion argument. That if you would have taken an hour to research, you could have come and made. But you failed can to I do that. Can I ask my question you now? Biology. Can Next I ask my person. question no, now? No, you can get behind the line. Back the you line. can sit here and you can like, try and create this argument patiently. and idea that you have of what we believe in and push it back in my face, but it's not going to work. Your you little get the back the logical line. fallacy ring around the rosy will not work on us. You disgust me. And if right, biology... She's waiting to speak, ma'am. You're... you're not allowing other women to speak. You invalidated my rape with a straight face. Okay, come on. We, were get, we said we're going to use mics only, okay? We're going to use mics only. We've got a lot, of, a lot of other folks here who have questions. We're going to talk afterwards, okay? Yes, we will. Yes, we will. I have um, two questions. Is that okay for you? Okay, so my first question, um, I heard that you're a Christian. Um, I was a Christian, um, for, well, I'm an agnostic now. Before I was a Baptist member of the church for almost eight years. Um, I've gone to a Baptist academy. Unfortunately, I'm not a part of the Baptist community anymore, but I am agnostic. So I just had a question for you as a Christian, um, because I, I try to think about it myself. Um, for victims who are uh, the rape was in a case of incest. Um, what do you think God would want us to do mm. when that baby could have complications of inbreeding mm. or any complications of that birth? What do you think God would want us to do if that baby would come out dead or have disabilities that could really impair either the mother and her life mm. or the child in their life? Personally, I have a terminally disabled sister as a product of inbreeding, and I'm just curious what you would think Mm -hmm. In a case of that, why wouldn't God want us to do an abortion? Mm -hmm. I think God doesn't want us to end his creation. And that all human beings are equally valuable because we were made, as a Christian, I believe we were made in God's image. That is where the value question comes into the abortion argument. Is do these human beings have value? 
um, if you are an atheist or agnostic. Um, I have pro-life friends who are atheists and agnostic, and they've had to separately come to terms with why they believe every human being has equal value. Um, but I, I don't think because a human being um, will be mentally disabled or have genetic abnormalities or difficulties, I still don't think that that, that means we have the right to end their life because I believe that every person on this earth has a purpose um, and despite the suffering that we all will endure, I don't think it is our place to play God and say, we think you're going to be born into poverty or your, you know, your mother's addicted to crack cocaine and you're going to live a terrible life. Therefore, we as society will tell you that you shouldn't be born. I don't, I don't think um, we have the right uh, to do that. And I think it's important to, I mean, I, like I said, I have, it was brought in my bio, I have two children who have cystic fibrosis. Um, the abortion rate for children with CF is about 95%. They use similar to an amniocentesis to diagnose. It's actually higher than Down syndrome. And the argument I hear from abortion supporters often is it's a selfish decision no, not, not to choose abortion. That it's selfish to, to not choose abortion when you know your child can have cystic fibrosis because these child will suffer and they'll have a hard life. And yes, my, child, my children who have CF will suffer. Uh, I will suffer, my husband will suffer. Uh, our whole family will suffer alongside of them. In fact, I could tell you there's no greater pain than being a parent and watching your child suffer and have like nothing you can do uh, to stop that suffering from taking place. But at the end of the day, I know the value that my children have and that there's a purpose for them. And I don't think we should ever, um, I think it's once again a slippery slope to say we should play God and we should euthanize certain people because they're at high risk for X, Y, or Z. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I understand where you're coming from with your terms of religion. Um, my second question, I heard you say that like a married heterosexual couple, they have sex, it's just a product of you guys being mar married, right? Um, do you believe that like birth control, i.e. in the forms of uh, hormonal birth control pills, an inserted IUD or a depo shot, are those abortion to you, or is that just a, a contraception? Mm -hmm. Contraception, sorry. Um, and do you believe that those contraceptives are abortion? Mm -hmm. I love your questions. Thank you. You're asking really good questions, uh, and you're doing it without screaming at me, so it's also helpful. Um, so when uh, you hear that the pro life movement actually has varying opinions on birth control. When we talk about birth control, there's barrier method birth control, uh, and then there's hormonal birth control. Um, as a sorry, organ, what was the first barrier word? method? Barrier so method. condoms, oh, as in dental condoms. dams, diaphragms. Um, they're not as effective at preventing pregnancy as hormonal, hormonal birth control. It's chemical birth control. As an organization, our organization, Students for Life, is a secular organization. Okay. So. Um, I don't know if we have any atheists or agnostics on staff right now, but it's, I know it's very evenly split between Catholic and Protestant, and there's differing religious views about the use of contraceptives, even in, within a marital relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and so we don't take a stance on barrier method contraceptives, because a barrier method contraceptive uh, can't kill a human being, an embryo, um, a zygote. It's not possible, right? It, it stops egg and sperm from uniting. Because we believe in the pro-life movement that science proves that when egg and sperm unite, a unique whole living human being comes to existence. A new genetic code that's never existed before and will never exist again. That is the moment. And we believe it's a slippery slope to start saying, oh, well, it's not really life until this, this, and this, because of what I've already illustrated. Um, I would say, personally, I am against uh, the use of chemical contraceptives because um, of their unintended consequence of ending a human life. We know, for example, IUDs can end a human life because majority of con conceptions actually happen in the fallopian tube. The IUD is in the uterine wall. And so what will happen is, depending on the type of IUD you have, if you have a hormonal IUD, it should be releasing chemicals that prevent the egg from releasing. A copper IUD doesn't really send any chemicals, it just spins. And what happens is the IUD prevents the new human being that forms in the fallopian tube from embedding into the uterine wall and growing. That is, in fact, an early abortion. We know birth control pills and Depo-Provera can act in the same way. 
They're supposed to stop ovulation from occurring, from the egg from releasing. But we all know, I know many women who are using birth control who got pregnant. We know breakthrough ovulation occurs. And even Guttmacher Institute and other pro-abortion think tanks will tell you that breakthrough ovulation occurs. There is a third mechanism in chemical contraceptive, which makes it makes the uterine wall inhospitable. So what happens is if conception does occur, if egg and sperm unite in the fallopian tube, as a the, as the new human being makes its way to the uterine lining, it will not allow the new human being to implant into the uterine wall, causing an early abortion. So that is why many pro-lifers would say we are against chemical contraceptives because we know breakthrough ovulation occurs. Um, we know that there are abortions being committed that many people uh, don't even know. It's usually like when you, you know, like your period starts way later and you're like, oh, what happened? And so to be uh, philosophically consistent, we know and what we advocate is that the moment of conception, a unique whole living life comes into existence and that human being has the same value as born people. And so we can't take a position of, well, it doesn't really have value until it implants into the uterine wall. And in fact, you can go to Walmart, get the back of the Plan B box, and it'll say on the back left side, it'll say will not harm an existing pregnancy. Then on the back right yeah, side, I've further taken a few. <laughs> what? I've taken a few, I've just never looked at yeah, the back. Yeah, on the back right side, mm -hmm. in smaller font, it'll say, it'll just like three, it says, may prohibit the implantation of a fertilized egg. That's an early abortion. Because if you Google the word fertilized egg, a fertilized egg is a woke term for embryo. It sounds less, uh, whole than saying embryo or zygote, but if you Google, like you type in fertilized egg, literally what pops up on Google is embryo or zygote. And so that is in fact an early abortion. Okay. Is that helpful? Yeah. As much as we don't agree, I thank you for your response. Yeah, thank you for coming. I really appreciate you being here. Hello. Oh, hello. Um, I just have a couple questions for you. Um, one, so like you think, you, your beliefs are that you, um, that life begins at conce conception, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so um, what about just sperm? That's a human, like, DNA organism. It's a part. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So if a man masturbates and that sperm does not seek an egg, is that not the same? No. No, because the sperm is, does not have the capacity to grow, metabolize. It can't do that. But a sperm could. is living. A, spar a sperm is a part of a person's body. That's what's so amazing about the science of contraception. Two parts combine and make one whole. And that sperm has genetics, has DNA from the father. The egg has DNA from the mother because sperm and egg are parts. I don't need parts. a biology lesson, ma'am. I, I took biology. I well, just they're parts. Your, I know that. I've taken biology. I just wanted to know if you thought it was killing potential babies because... No. There's okay. A, you know, ejaculation or but it ovulation could, okay. doesn't kill a potential human. There's no human being that has been created. Those are mere parts. Okay. Um, my next question is... Um, my next question is... Um, how does it affect your day-to-day -day life whether or not I've had an abortion? Because I think that human beings, as human beings who know the truth about uh, what happens inside of a woman's body, how a child grows and develops, and when we know that violence is occurring, I think we have no other response than we must speak up because that's what we're called to do. When we look at um, the suffragists, we look at those who fought against child labor, when we look at the civil rights activists, there were a lot of people who came from, for example, who came from the North to ride on freedom rides to be arrested and put into federal penitentiaries in Mississippi. It didn't matter to them. These were white college students from the North who went down into the Deep South. They did it because they knew injustice was occurring. I believe that if you know injustice is occurring, you have a moral responsibility to speak up against that injustice and not to look the other way. Because when we look the other way, atrocities happen. That's exactly what's happened in our country with more than 63 million abortions. Okay, so 
Like the girl previously said to me, um, I don't know your religious background. Oh, actually, you said you were a Christian, correct? Mm -hmm. um, is that where you get your moral background from? Because I'm not. And like you said earlier, it's whether or not you've placed value on mm -hmm. the fetus or the baby or whatever. Why, do you, why does what you think is valuable not, exactly. why is it not this, why does it matter if I don't? It's my body. Why should your beliefs dictate that? Because I believe when we start subscribing different values to the same group of human beings, oh, no. the result is, is always devastation. But that, it's devastating to you. It's not devastating no, to me. No, it's devastating to those human beings. And when we look throughout history. What are they missing out on? They didn't have a life. They were alive until they were they ended didn't, no, in human in, in, in abortion. You didn't, I said they didn't have a life. They did not miss out on anything. They, they don't even, if, it's not like it missed out on experiencing the human life as a whole once it was aborted. Mm -hmm. So why, why? So I mean, that's, but that's also a slippery slope. What about people who are, who, who get in a car wreck and are in a coma and are not having any experiences? What stops us from euthanizing that person? Because they're not having a life. They're just laying in a bed. That person having was already no born. But um, you didn't really answer my question earlier when I asked you what, how does it affect your day-to-day -day life whether or not you've known, you know whether or not I've had an abortion? It affects all of our lives no, because it we live in a society that says that killing some people based on their convenience or based on their size is okay. And the results of that is devastating. The result is the fact that you guys can come here and sit and scream at me and curse at me and whatever because we devalue other human beings. Because that, that's a problem. We can see the result of abortion time and time again in our society. When we start saying certain people don't matter, certain people don't have a work life. For example, I got called yesterday by a friend at, at, at uh, US House Representatives. There is actually a movement now amongst those who support Obamacare and uh, Affordable Care Act to pass something called Qualies. It's called qual Quality Adjusted Life Years. What is a Quality, you may ask? A Quality is uh, something a think tank prescribes, and they decide what type of care human beings receive based on the quality of life they may have if they get that care and how long, how much more longer they may leave, live if they get that care. So my son and daughter are on a medicine that costs about $300,000 a year. It's one of the most expensive medicines there is and it will hopefully make them have a normal life. It's one of the biggest me medical advances we've ever had in the history of our world. It, it's a pill that corrects an actual genetic defect. It's amazing. These academics have decided that because my children may only live an extra 10 or 20 years, the cost of the drug isn't worth my children receiving it because they put a price on what my children are. That is a result of abortion, of saying certain people matter and certain people don't, that we're willing to then put prices on people's heads to say you only matter this much. You should only receive health care to this amount. But you have a genetic defect, and you're not going to live as long as other people, so you shouldn't have access to these expensive drugs that are going to extend your life. That's the result of saying that, that unborn children, preborn children don't matter, and that we get to decide individually. Uh, individually. I have never lost more brain cells listening to a single conversation. Thank you. Let's let him ask a question. There's like a long line. What are you going to shut that up? What are you going to do about this? What are you going to do? Oh my God. What are you going to do? Are you going to smack the bitch? Yeah, you're going to smack the bitch? Judy. Yes, sir. Okay, I just want to start off by saying I'm black and white, so I'm on both sides. Yay. So, sorry, that was like said earlier. I actually have some like real legit questions that I don't know the answer to. Okay, I'm religious as well. I'm not Christian, but like very religious and sp spiritual. Another religion, just not Christian. Um, so for the, I know the, the cases that are rape and incest, I know the numbers are very, very tiny, I know. But just, the, just for out of my curiosity, the very few numbers, what is a, what is a, 
what is a, like an alternative or what, what's a, a valid explanation from a fellow monotheist, monotheistic believer about those, like the small rape cases, the small incest mm -hmm. cases, like what, what would happen? Like what is a good, like, can you just help me with that? Yeah, so in the pro-life movement, we oppose abortion even in cases of sexual assault or incest. Um, and when we write laws, like the law we just helped pass in Oklahoma that's going to be signed into law this week, hopefully, uh, which criminalizes abortion, putting an abortionist in jail uh, for committing an abortion, um, does not have a rape uh, incest exception to it. Because fundamentally, we don't believe your value as a human being changes because of your parents. And so what we would say is, what are the practical things we can do? Because no one in the pro-life movement is saying, you have to become a mother, especially a woman uh, who is a survivor of sexual assault. That's not the message. But as I pointed out earlier in my talk, there are safe haven laws. There's adoption. There are literally wait lists of millions of couples waiting to adopt newborn children. Uh, these children do not get put into foster care, or they might get put in foster care for like a month, uh, and then they're, then they're adopted into a, a family. So, so, it's, so. A le it's a lesson to be learned in it as well, though, for them. Even, yeah. mm -hmm. even though it's a tragedy, it's still a lesson to be learned. Yeah. In it. And that doesn't mean that the baby is like deserving of death. No, if my father went out and committed a rape tonight or an act of terrorism, there would be no legal justification for people to call for the end of my life. Because we all universally, these people might disagree, believe that I have value as a human being and that I have a, I have a right to life. Okay, so, so as a fellow believer of God, um, which is apparently like the, we're the weird ones for believing in God. Um, how can you explain like that we do not really like, I just like to talk to somebody like who has more information. That way, when I talk, have like this conversation with somebody, I'm fully informed. Like, how can a believer of God, like, how can we realize that we do not have ownership of our own bodies? Like, this is not ours to keep. So, this, like, this, our choice, like women say this is our choice. Like, yeah. it's not our well, choice. Well, there's limits make. on freedom. And that, that's what the whole argument about abortion is. You'll see freedom of choice, my body, my choice. When we're talking about uh, making abortion unthinkable, making abortion illegal, we're talking about placing a limit on people's freedom. And we as a society have already agreed that there's limits on freedom. There's limits of what you can do with your body. Can you choose to, um, I don't know, cook meth in your home when children are present? Yeah, you can do it and you'll be held liable for that. Can a woman choose to smoke crack cocaine when she's pregnant and give birth to a child? Will she be held liable when her child's born addicted to crack cocaine? Yes, she will. Can you go into a, the pediatric pulmonology ward in my children's hospital and start smoking cigarettes? No, you can't. There are limits to what you can do with your body. Um, it is not uh, anything goes. And we as a society have already accepted that, that your freedom, that your, what you can do with your body stops when it limits someone else's body, when it harms someone else's body. And that's why our founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence, they wrote life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness because there's a fundamental hierarchy of rights. That your liberty, that your pursuit of happiness cannot trump another human being's right to life. And when those rights get disordered, chaos always ensues. That's exactly what we saw happen time and time again throughout American history. That was a great right. answer. Can we go to the next question? Sorry. I have a long Appreciate drive. No, no problem. Uh, I just want to say thank you. You did a great job, and I apologize. You have to listen to people like that. Have a good night. Thank you for coming. Hi. Yeah. All right, go ahead, Melanie. My name is Melanie. Um, I'm a Chicana. I identify as a feminist. And I also have uh, literature with me, Why Should Non-Christians Care About Abortion? If anyone's curious, it's from a group called Secular Pro-Life. If anyone would like to learn from a secular perspective. Also, I have stickers that say, call me an extremist, but I think dismemberment is wrong from Secular Pro-Life. So if anyone's interested, I'd love to give these out. No, not really. And also, I just wanted to speak on behalf of survivors. I myself am a survivor of child sexual abuse. I was abused for eight years of my childhood by a family member. And so I am pro-life. And I think of my own life, I think of my own experience, I think of how innocent I was. And I think if there was 
a new human to have come from that experience, how much more so that human would have been even more innocent than me as a child. So I just wanted to share that as a pro-life survivor. And um, what I also wanted to share, Kristen, earlier in the talk, you had mentioned if anyone wants to share ideas mm -hmm. for what a post-Roe America, post-Roe Texas would look like. And I really wanted to share some of my ideas of what I hope that would look like. So I know that Texas has $100 million for the Alternatives to Abortion Act to help men and women who did not choose abortion. And so I picture more funding like that. I picture government mandated a paid family leave, because I know right now there's not government mandated <laughs> paid family leave, and I think we definitely need that. I picture um, childcare accessible in the libraries on campus. I picture more lactation rooms. I picture reserved parking for pregnant and parenting students. And so those are just some of my ideas. And I really wanted to ask you the question of what are the systems you would want to see in place in that post row America? Mm. Yeah, I think, thank you for doing that. I really think that's important. I think one of the pro-abortion people mentioned earlier uh, about, you know, sex ed. I think that's actually a stunning indictment where she was saying that, you know, girls didn't know where their period came from. That's a problem. You need basic biology information presented to you. I think that's a very important thing that needs to be presented to young people in schools. Obviously not by people who make money off of bad decision making like Planned Parenthood. I mean, that's, it's a completely asinine that Planned Parenthood is this uh, leading provider of birth of sex ed when they're literally the ones who profit off of bad decision making. It's like having Philip Morris come and tell people uh, not to smoke, that's not gonna work out. Um, so I think that's one place to start. I actually really much agree with your paid family leave. At Students Life, we're one of the, I think we're the only national product group that's actually lobbied for paid family leave. Uh, alternatives and solutions across the country. I think it's, it's, like I said earlier in my presentation, I think the workplace has a very, very far place to go uh, when it comes to being accommodating to pregnant and parenting women. Like at Students for Life, we obviously are pretty much all female um, and we have a lot of babies because we're pro-life. We like to procreate. Um, and so we have to be very accommodating uh, of workers uh, who come back to work. Flexible time, time off, you know, working from home, working from the office, bringing your child to work. Uh, my children are here right now. Um, you know, allowing employees to bring a child into an office place or to travel with them. I think it takes an actual real conversation. Every circumstance is different because it depends on the family, depends on the woman, um, you know, what she has going on in her life. I, I would love to see a real conversation about that ensue, uh, you know, and how you can, you know, mandate paid family leave without burdening small business owners and using our own social security money that we are putting into a big pot that we're probably never going to see anyway. Um, let us use it for paid family leave. Um, so I think that's a really great way to start. I love the Alternative to Abortion Act that Texas has. It's leading the way of the $100 million um, that's serving over 100,000 women and families um, up until two or three years old after the birth of the child. I think Texas, you know, half of all children born in Texas uh, are uh, on Medicaid. Um, that's fantastic, and so we need to do a better job of making sure that no woman feels like she doesn't have access to quality medical care. Um, I think there's a real discussion that has to be had in our communities about what quality medical care uh, looks like. So yeah, those are some. Awesome, and I just want to share any uh, resource for any survivors in the room. Texas does not have a cap for when you can report um, that sexual violence. There's no cap in the state of Texas. So, yeah. and I know this from my own experience, there's no cap whether you were three years old, 13 or 33, whatever mm -hmm. it happened, there's no cap to report that. Point. You can call 911 and tell 911 that you want to make a report for sexual violence. And that's how I did it. Yeah. So I just wanted to share that if there's any survivors in the room. Yeah. Thank right, you. Two more questions. Good evening to you. Um, my question for you is, even though you say that a baby's value matters, no matter if a woman was raped, no matter if they're financially not stable, in poverty, as you say, you still think it's okay for a woman who is suffering inside to carry a baby for nine months and still have to take care of a child? 
that's, that's what you're telling is me? Is that your question? Yes, it is. Um, I don't think, in, no one in the pro-life movement advocates that a woman has to become a mother. We just advocate that she doesn't kill a child. So if a woman is a victim or survivor of sexual assault, she's not, and she becomes pregnant, uh, no one is forcing her to become a parent because we know a parent, becoming a parent is an 18-year uh, commitment, financial, emotional commitment. That's why I brought up earlier in my presentation about safe haven laws. Every state has safe haven laws. That a woman can legally surrender her child with no repercussions at any, you know, three days without any questions asked after the birth of her child. She can also make an adoption plan for free, no cost to her. Um, what we believe in the pro-life movement is that she is strong enough to choose someone vulnerable and weaker than her and to be inconvenienced for nine months. And it is not a convenience being pregnant. I've been pregnant four times. It's certainly not easy, but we actually believe she is strong enough to do that. So even though she was a rape victim, you still think that the value of a child is okay? Yeah, e I, I would say especially our crimes when of our it comes fathers, to her mental health. The crimes of our fathers do not negate our value. And once again, what you just said with the, the mental health, that's also a slippery slope. Because none of us would say that if she gives birth to the child, she chooses, nobly chooses to parent her child, not place for adoption, not give her child over to the state with a safe haven law. None of us would say, well, you know, at two years old, if she starts experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder again, she's justified in drowning her baby in the bathtub. None of us would say that was okay. We would say that's wrong, that just because a child um, is making a mother experience PTSD or having flashbacks to the crime that was committed against her, it doesn't justify an act of violence against that person. Next question. I have no more questions, but I yeah. don't value your reasons. I will pray for you, though. Thank you for asking your question. Last question, and I really have to go. Hello. So uh, you pointed out earlier that whenever someone who gets pregnant, not just women, because women aren't the only ones who can get pregnant. Men can get pregnant too. There are such things as trans men. Trans men can get pregnant. So, no, they're not women, they're men. Trans men are men. But anyways, but anyways, as I was saying before, I was interrupted. Um, you say they do not have to become a parent. But uh, another way they could do it is foster system. No. This is just not, no, I'm not I saying that's the only system. reason. I'm not saying this is the only reason. I'm saying this is a thing that they could do. But foster systems are severely broken but that's in the, this age. I'm not saying I'm you brought it back no. up your definition. Because that's not, that's not the point of foster care. Foster care isn't to give your child over to the system. It's about family reunification. I'm saying that a lot of people give their ch children up to foster care or adoption agencies or wherever you're talking about. But a lot of people that go into the foster care system can attest it to being awful. You want to subject these children that just because their parents didn't want them, you want to put them into a system that doesn't care for them, that they're four times more likely to commit suicide, seven times more likely to have depression, two times more likely to have learning disabilities and uh, suffer from all of these different things. You want them to suffer through all this just because you're forcing this person to have a baby? Is it so if someone's going to suffer, is it better just to kill them? I'm not saying that. What? I'm not saying that. Well, that's, what, that's what you're saying. You're saying you don't want them to go to I'm the foster care you would system rather... because of all of these statistics showing how children in foster care suffer. I'm saying right? you would rather this person put up their baby to have a terrible life and pro most likely end so up So what's the more compassionate option? So to what, have an abortion. To kill it. Do you think there's anything less extreme you can prescribe to that situation than Are you saying the foster care system is a viable option when multiple children die every day in there? I'm saying when a woman is pregnant with a child that she does not want to parent, she's not placing into a foster and care And I'm saying system. not only women can get pregnant. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when a woman is pregnant and she doesn't want to become a mother, she can choose I like to place only her child with an adoptive women. family. I love that. That's or great. she can choose 
to use the already accessible safe haven laws to give up her child to the state. Those children, yeah, those and the newborn state doesn't give babies, a fuck about do not languish in foster care. They don't languish in foster care. Why? Because there's over a million. What couples about all in the cases today where kids go waiting, to families that don't care about them and suffer from domestic newborns. abuse? When you're talking about foster care, we're talking about older children, not newborns. Older children whose parents have lost the right to parent them because of abuse, because of alcohol or drugs, that's, because because they've been imprisoned. That's we're not, not talking the case. about babies going into foster care. What I ask you is, do you think there's anything less extreme we can do as a society rather than saying, well, you may end up in foster care. We don't know. But you may end up in foster care. And you may have a hard life. Therefore, I judge you, and I think it's okay for someone to dismember you. That, in fact, is I think is that it is the person who's pregnant. I think it is their choice whether they want to succumb their ch child that they might have into that life or to give it the option to get rid of it so it doesn't have to suffer through life like that. Do you think I was selfish for giving birth to my two children with cystic fibrosis because they're going to suffer? I do that was your choice but, to do that. But the ch my child's going to suffer. Is that selfish? But it's your me? choice. So it's my choice whether or not my child suffers. Yes. No, it's not. It's really good. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming out tonight. I really yeah, appreciate it. Yeah. If you hate abortion, get a vasectomy. If you hate abortion, get a vasectomy.